Hi, so I'm Stephanie Patrick. I'm managing editor of Ad Week and editor of Brand Week, this edition you have here. And I'm going to have a conversation with Jen Rubio. So Jen is the uh, co-founder and the chief brand officer of Away. It's a very young luggage company, but they've seen staggering growth in a short amount of time. Um, they've produced 500,000 yeah, 500, uh, suitcases, and um, they've grown from four humble employees to 200 in less than three years. So you see this luggage probably all over your Instagram feeds, and you see Jen on the cover of this magazine, and now she's going to come and join me on the stage. <laughs> great to have you here. I'm so impressed with, with the turnout, given how many people I saw in the hotel lobby late last <laughs> night. <Yeah. laughs> it was a late night, but we're all here. We're excited for you. Um, so you are the first person to grace a cover of Brand Week um, since this title was last in print in 2011. So I really... I went, I went to the green room and replaced all the Kevin Hart magazines with mine. She so. did. <laughs> And she was like thoroughly Instagramming every page of the magazine. Yeah. So, so check out her handle. It's for um, my mom. <laughs> so, so Jen, something that you talked with um, our um, senior branding editor about for this story was the beginning of a way and how you got the idea. I love a good origin story, and I feel like you have a good one. What sparked the idea? Well, it's only a good one because it doesn't involve this this business school thing of like creating a matrix where there's opportunities to create businesses because I didn't know how to do that. Um, but essentially, my luggage broke, and um, you know we always talk about seeing this gap in the market when that happened, because I was you know, shopping and trying to find a new one. But there, there were kind of two gaps. From the product side, uh, if you think about it, there was like really nice, high quality luggage, or super expensive, um, or just like cheap luggage that you knew was going to break. You, um, I live near Canal Street in New York, and there's just like all these like random no-name luggage stores, but you, you knew that wasn't going to last you. And that's kind of where creating high quality luggage and an affordable price point and the direct-to-consumer model came in. Um, but that's not what really got us excited. Um, Believe it or not, I did not like grow up dreaming about selling luggage. <laughs> so um, we we also identified like a more exciting gap, which is in building a brand around it. And if you think about legacy luggage brands, people would always talk about things like um, like ballistic nylon or um, what the frame of the luggage is made out of or the wheels and the zippers, but no one actually ever talked about travel. Mm -hmm. um, and no one ever actually talked about like the trips you would take it on. Sometimes you'd see marketing campaigns where it's like, you know, an, a legacy luggage brand on like a like a boat in the middle of paradise, and it's, it's, it was just like not realistic, and um, and no one actually thought about the emotional part of it, and I think that's that's what got us excited, where um, we could kind of create this new brand in the travel and travel goods industry, and start by creating that perfect piece of luggage. Um, I want to ask the audience, how many people here have had the experience of their luggage breaking, like a zipper gets stuck, a roller pops off. Okay, and how many of you decided to start a luggage company <laughs> to solve that problem? <laughs> and, and no one. Um, how many of you just it. bought a new suitcase? So, Jen, I'm curious to know what what is it in you that made you want to go down the path of an entrepreneur, and actually, like, what made you take this hard road? I think, um, to be honest, I think a lot of it was my was my co-founder. Um, I don't think you need a co-founder to, to start a successful company, but um, I kind of went to her being like, hey, there's this thing that I'm seeing. Um, there, there's like an interesting gap for something that doesn't exist yet. And um, I wouldn't say like either of us were trying to start a company, but the more we talked about it, the more um, our back, we had met at Warby Parker uh, years and years earlier. She went to business school. I went. Um, I moved to London to work for another brand. And um, the more we talked about it, the more we realized we could actually do it. And this was kind of around the time we we started the company. Uh, we started working on it in 2015, um, in, in January of 2015, and it was when like the Warby Parker of everything mm -hmm. was being pitched to investors, and we were like, wait a second, we worked at Warby Parker, <laughs> we can make the Warby Parker <laughs> of luggage. Um, and, and I think having, 
had that experience at a startup, um, really pushed it. But I mean, even after, I don't know, even if the week we incorporated the company, she and I were still like considering and negotiating jobs elsewhere. I was like, I was moving back to New York. Um, I was talking to a few brands to to run marketing for them, and she was she was going to run supply chain at a direct to consumer startup, and um, and we both quietly just didn't take the job offers. So I don't know if we were kind of. I think it actually helped that we weren't that kind of like gung ho entrepreneur, like we're going to start a company because it meant that we really wanted to do it. Yeah. I, your coworkers have told me that in some ways you're kind of a reluctant founder, like that you, you love the, the branding aspect, but there are other parts of the job that you, know, you, you wouldn't have necessarily chosen, but you've adapted to. Can you tell me like, what, parts, <laughs> what parts of the job have been hard for you? I'm and like, how who told you this? I, I, I'm not naming <laughs> It depends names. who you spoke to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think something that nobody tells you is that you become a founder and you hire all these people and your job essentially becomes a lot of HR, mm -hmm. um, a lot of recruiting. And I think you know, anytime you start a company, you're constantly selling the company, whether it's to investors, to customers, to press. Um, but the team is so important. And if you had told me in the beginning, hey, you can start this luggage brand, but you're going to spend you know, more than half your time recruiting and dealing with people issues within the organization and thinking about organizational development, like, I don't know if I would have done it. Yeah. But I'm getting good. <laughs> and I, I heard a story that in like the very early days, um, you and Steph sat down and made post-it notes of what this company might look like in a year if it was successful and divvied up the post-it notes. Yeah, so that, that was, that's, I think that's another key part of why I was able to like really wrap my head around starting this company. It's because we kind of made post-it notes of like all of the departments that the company would need and we we're like, okay, which ones would you want to oversee? And we kind of just divvied up the post-it notes and there was like an even amount um, afterwards and there were no post-it notes left. So it was kind of like, okay, we have all bases covered. And um, I think that's tough. I think I see a lot of um, co-founder pairs or, um, or groups where a lot of people, um, a lot of people start companies with people they've worked with, so they end up having the same background um, or the same skill set, and I think that's when you kind of start to see the conflict or even ambiguity around um, what everyone's going to do. But from the beginning, uh, Steph and I were really clear on on the things that we were good at and the things we wanted to do, and I think the sign of a great co-founder pair is when. Um, you know, she looks at my job and she looks at like the brand we cover and she's like, I don't know, that's like that's not for me. <laughs> and um, and I look at the things that she does and now she she runs the company and she runs a very tight ship and I'm just like so grateful that that she can do all of that because I know I can't. Um, and and I think that we started with that where a lot of founders um, have to figure that out down the line, and it's a harder conversation. Yeah, it sounds like you guys balance each other out well, and that you do a good job of hiring for your weaknesses, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just basically across the board now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, so I understand that really early on, you guys like hit a big challenge, in that you were expecting to launch for the holiday shopping season, and the, there was some sort of production delay, right? The bags weren't ready in time. Um, can you talk about kind of how that was a defining moment and how you guys solved for that problem? Yeah, and it, was, it wasn't as <laughs> um, crisis mode as, as it sounds, but basically, we knew we wanted to launch before the holidays, so this was in 2016. Um, one, of the, one of the first things we invested in as a company um, was press, so we hired we hired a PR agency before we hired any anyone else actually, and um, had lined up a bunch of great press around the brand and what we were doing, and that was going to hit in time for the holidays. We had um, gotten all these amazing gift guide placements, and that was a feat in and of itself. Um, but the bags weren't going to be ready until like February of the next year. So I think. You know, you think about what a company does there. You either delay the launch, which we didn't want to do. Like, holiday is such a key time. Um, so you either delay the launch. You maybe um, do, like, a pre-order, which I think is one of the worst things uh, you can do as a brand because it's like no one's heard of you. You want them to put money down for this product that they've never seen. Um, and I personally, maybe I'm just, like, easily fooled, but I've done a bunch of pre-orders and just have never gotten anything. Um, so... 
we were like, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we show people what kind of brand we are, the kind of people we're aligned with. We um, had like a great network of, um, of influencers and communities who were really excited about us. And how do we like keep these press placements that we're definitely not gonna get in February? Um, so we did what any normal person would do and we decided to publish a book. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> we had- uh, You didn't see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're like Kickstarter. No, but we, we decided to publish this beautiful like coffee table book and gift box. I've seen some on eBay, um, and I, can, I think I can figure out who's selling them. <laughs> but I, um, we interviewed like 40 like, tastemakers, mm -hmm. um, like Adam Rappaport from Bon Appetit, like just a great, like people who aren't necessarily household names or celebrities, but were very esteemed in their communities. And we asked them about where they travel and, um, and the places they return to. And in that book was a gift card for $225 for, for the suitcase that was coming. And people were so excited. Um, we, we were like, this is either a great idea or we're gonna, or there's gonna be thousands of books in our living room for like the next 10 years. <laughs> Um, and they sold out within a week. Like the the press came through. People were were I think people were more excited about the book than than the suitcase because they're like, here's this incredible um, brand that's all about travel the way I see it. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, it was like it was a real turnaround moment for us yeah. before we even launched. And you guys have sort of um, continued into publishing. I hope you don't mind if I share this. So um, they have a, a custom, Away has a custom magazine called Here that they produce in-house with an in-house editorial team. Um, what is the goal of that? And, and even more broadly, can you talk a little bit more about that hole in the luggage market in terms of storytelling around travel? Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, so when we started Here Magazine, um, you know, all, again, all of this was around travel and around storytelling. Um, and uh, about six months to a year in, we we're like, okay, we obviously need some sort of um, some sort of editorial aspect of all of this. Um, separately, we had started to see this really weird thing happening where, you know, we would do brand campaigns and photo shoots, um, like in Tokyo, in Panama. Like, I mean, for the first year, I the best job on earth. Um, and we we would post the photos and people would call our customer service line or email and say, hey, like, saw you guys just went to Tokyo. Where should we eat? Like, what should we do? What hotel should we stay in? And we're essentially using our customer service line as like a travel agent or um, <laughs> for travel recommendations. And, and I'm not gonna name any names, but I just like, don't know if you could imagine doing that with any of the legacy luggage brands, like calling their customer service <laughs> to me, like, where should I stay? So we, um, we definitely saw this gap in the market for um, for a place to kind of make those recommendations, to tell those stories. And going in and, and building Here Magazine, I think we realized um, we could really bet on it in a way that would benefit our brand either way. Like worst case scenario, we'd have like a really great travel blog for the company and best case, this could be a standalone media division that's generating revenue, generating profit for the company while also giving us this editorial platform. Um, so we started, it was a kind of like a startup within a startup, which is a, which is like what innovation labs call themselves in big companies. But really for us, it was like a startup within a 15 person startup. <laughs> and we, um, we created a print magazine, online magazine. We did um, an extension of the editorial arm and did a podcast last summer. And and it was incredible. We One, we had an amazing distribution platform because it's going in this suitcase. Mm -hmm. um, so it means that anyone who's buying it has like a certain amount of income, uh, is about to travel, um, and is, is like we knew exactly who, like the demographic that it's going to because we're a director consumer company and these are our customers. And that actually became very appealing to advertisers and to partners. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're going in the direction of that best case scenario, but, but still at the foundation of it, we're just still really proud to have the storytelling platform. Yeah, this is something I think about a lot with direct to consumer brands. I mean, we see like the model is pick one thing and make it really well and make the customer service experience shine. Um, do you think that brands can, can, can sustain the kind of growth that you've had with one product? Um, or do you need to branch out into things like this, uh, which can be risky too? 
Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to branch out, and I, I think um, if you if you think of well-known global brands, there there is a hero product that they're they're known for or that they started with. So I think a lot of the branching out has to do on the product side. I mean, I think one thing that's a real that's a big testament to the brand that we're building is that you know there's a lot of excitement around away, but until until like March or April of this year, all we sold was a suitcase. And we started introducing um, like soft goods and, and the, like the everywhere bag that sits perfectly on top of your suitcase and the packing cubes that go inside um, and expanding the travel goods line. But all of this excitement was really, uh, you know, I'd go on stage, like I'd, I'd talk in press and say, like, we're, we're way more than luggage. And then people go on the website and so you're just one piece of luggage. Um, <laughs> but but it was more about like that feeling that the people understood that we were trying to do more. So when we think about our growth, we think about um, like brand extensions, like the magazine. Um, we've done pop-up hotels, which have been really successful, um, and thinking about travel experiences that we can impact. But then there's also just a huge future ahead of us in terms of, of product expansion and you know, do we go into travel apparel? Do we go, like, there's just so many directions that we can go in. Um, I think we're, we're starting internally to shift our mindset from being, like, the direct-to-consumer luggage brand mm -hmm. um, because, because we know that there's, there's so much more potential out there. And I think if you think about, you know, the number of people in the U.S., especially in, like, coastal cities who are, who use Instagram, who want a hard shell suitcase, like you're gonna hit a cap on, on how brand your big can be, uh, how big your brand can be. <laughs> and, um, and, and for us, we're just trying to think past that, but we're still really just scratching the surface. Like we, we still don't have that much awareness, um, you know, and, and again, our first, you know, 100 million or so in revenue was just on that one suitcase. So think about what more we can do. How do you um, how do you choose where you want to go next? Like which product you want to launch next? Do you have a way of testing that out? Yeah. So we we're really one of the things we did before we even had customers was interview a ton of people because um, we were actually trying to test the strategy of do we you know do we become basically like a Tumi and just launch a bunch of suitcases and different types for different people. Or do we say, hey, we're just going to figure out exactly what a traveler needs and create that product for them, which is why I think we we're able to, to achieve that kind of growth with one product. It was because we interviewed hundreds of people, asked them what they wanted, asked them what they needed, and created a product that basically met the, the needs of, of most travelers. Um, and I think as we expand our product line, we're taking that same approach. Uh, the best part about it is now we have hundreds of thousands of customers. We have tens of thousands who have actually opted into giving us this kind of feedback that we can tap directly, that we can, um, that we can do focus groups with, um, that, that can test our products beforehand. Um, and we're taking a very, you know, there's, we have uh, like gut feelings and instinct about what we should launch next, but we have an amazing customer base to test that on. Yeah. And I understand you um, you have a partnership now. You've come out with a backpack with Carly Kloss. Is that right? Is that a way for you to sort of test the waters and see if there's an actual market for this or if it you know can be sort of one and done? Um, yeah, I think so. We've so we did a collaboration with Carly Kloss earlier this year, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things in her capsule collection um, was a backpack. We we did um, another collaboration with Dwayne Wade, uh, I think like, that's out today. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things in there is like a wine case. So I think the collaborations are, are an interesting way to, to test if, if, actually if we can make the product, mm -hmm. um, but the, it's not a great test for if, if consumers really want it because all the collections sell out. A lot of it is based on, um, like we don't, we don't make enough to properly test it, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think it is just it, what we do with the collaborations. It's more a reflection of what that person um, wants to create and how they travel, um, and we see based on um, like Instagram comments and based on customer emails if those products are something we should make in the long run. And 
I'm curious to know your thoughts about the longevity of um, influencer marketing. And I know I've seen a lot of brands pop up that feel like they're made for Instagram. They look beautiful, they're really aspirational. Um, there are these great influencer partnerships, but it's relatively new in terms of the history of brands. Um, we don't know what kind of staying power these, these brands have. Like, are they, are they built for the moment or are they built to last? I have no idea. I think, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, um, it's actually crazy because every time I open Instagram, I just get an ad for like this new, I mean, how easy it is to actually create a product, whether it's good or not, but you can like, you can find factories online, you can, um, you know, whip up some logo. Like, I, I think like the bare bones of like what it takes to, to start a company, like the bar is lower than ever. And you can just like go on Instagram, spend a bunch of money on, on Instagram and Facebook ads, acquire some customers, and then all of a sudden you have this, like you have like a million dollars in sales, but you just you just don't know where that's gonna go. And I think over the next few years we'll see um, a lot of a lot of companies, you know, c like come in and out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the companies that are are doing this to have a long term effect, or that. Um, companies like us, we want to be around for decades. Um, we'll just have to approach it really differently. Like we don't um, inject all of our um, all of our marketing dollars on Facebook. We do, we don't just want to pay to acquire customers. Um, and I think you can do that, but it, also you're going to hit your cap like very very quickly. Um, so I think the companies who are focused on building the teams and building the culture and building the relationship with the customer so that when they want to expand past that first product, you already have that, that pent up demand, those are the ones that are going to last. And I'm curious too to get your predictions about um, direct to consumer brands in the sense, are we heading toward a future where as customers we're going to be you know, buying every individual product, you know, uh, directly from a brand? Or is this just a right fit for a certain kind of product? I think, um, <laughs> I think there is, um, you're going to want to buy things from a brand if you have an emotional connection for the brand. And if you don't, you're going to buy it from Amazon. Mm -hmm. That's how I shop now. And I think that um, there, there's not really an in-between, even if there's like, Let's think about fashion. Even there's a fashion brand that I like, and even if they're in department stores and they're not on Amazon, I'm going to go out of my way to buy from that brand, whether it's because like the merchandising is um, is is better on their site, or um, or maybe because I know about how margins work and I want to support that <laughs> brand. But I think I think that's really um, for for the average consumer, it's going to be about ease and convenience. And the only reason that you would go beyond something that's really easy and really convenient is if you have an emotional connection yeah. with that brand. Like you can buy a suitcase on Amazon, um, won't be as good, uh, but, but people go out of their way and go on our website to order from us because of the experience that we provide and because of like the, the journey that we take them on. Um, and because they want to be associated with that brand. And before we existed, like luggage had really just become a, a commodity. So I think over the next few years, you'll see a lot of um, products that you thought were a commodity, like maybe cleaning supplies or, or cookware. And you'll see like more and more brands pop up um, to kind of to fill that like emotional void. Um, but I think there are just some categories that don't lend themselves that well to emotional connection. I think what you said about emotional connection is probably the big takeaway here, that, that people are going to buy from brands where they feel emotional connection. If they don't, they're going to go to Amazon or they're going to go to some place that feels maybe a little less personal. Um, I'm curious to know if you um, picked up any lessons from your time at Warby Parker about creating that kind of emotional connection with a customer. I know you were the social, social media manager there, right? Yeah, I think. Um and this was in like 2011, Warby Parker was just starting out. And I remember all of my friends were like, you're going to go sell glasses online? Like, that's so weird. Um, <laughs> and it, like, it was weird, but it was a good move. Um, <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> at, yeah, it worked out pretty well. Um, but I think it was a lot of, um, honestly, I think part of it was like, we were, it's kind of like with, with luggage, like, 
no one who had worked at Warby Parker then was like, one day I'm going to sell glasses and it's going to be amazing. People um, were drawn to the mission, to the brand, to, to the way they talked about it. And, and you know, Warby Parker has stayed largely a, they're, they just sell glasses, mm -hmm. um, but people like what it stood for and people like the stories we were telling and um, the way we kind of drew the emotional connection there was um, like through things like the home try on, like getting people really excited to try different pairs of glasses and, um, and getting like online feedback about it. Um, and those are the things we were doing in the very early days of the brand. But I think at Away, um, we get to have a lot more fun. It's not just, um, not just it's not just about the product it's like travel is inherently so emotional already and um, part of the reason we saw that that gap for a brand like us is that um, you know people as you guys know like you guys are only gonna go back to the office after this trip and you're gonna talk about Palm Springs and all the stuff that's happened and all your coworkers are gonna be like okay we got it like you went on a trip <laughs> and Every, if you've ever like sat next to anyone who just came back from a vacation, it's like it's all they can talk about. So there's already this this narrative that we can tap into that I actually think was a lot harder to do with glasses. Yeah. Um, and I want to shift gears for a moment and talk a little bit about the culture within your company. And um, one thing that I know Away did, I think before you even sold a single luggage, was um, partnering with a nonprofit um, called Peace Direct. And um, I understand that every single employee of yours also has a role in that nonprofit. Can you tell me a bit more about that and specifically how that affects the culture within your organization? Yeah, so before, before we sold a single yeah. piece of luggage, we were, Steph and I were kind of like, okay, we're building this thing. Um, it has the potential to fail, but it also has the potential to be really successful. Um, and the way we both see it is, is kind of like, what's the point of creating a company if you're not going to have like a net positive impact on the world? Like we didn't want to, we, we definitely didn't want to fail, but we didn't want to be successful at like, um, at the expense of a lot of other things. So we knew that um, we wanted to just, just to, to do really well, but also do good in the world. And um, we had obviously come from like the Warby Parker one for one model, um, but it's, it's actually probably no one's ever heard of our partnership with Peace Direct because it hasn't been super outward facing. Um, we're starting to, to talk about it a little bit more, but we, um, you know, we believe that like travel is this like inherently powerful thing. It like opens you up to new cultures, gives you new ideas. Um, but there's just so much going on in the world where um, where a lot of like the the disagreements and misunderstandings in the world um, just stem from people not not understanding other cultures. So, Peace Direct is this organization that works on the ground with. Um, peace building and, and peacekeepers, like some of the projects we worked on are, like we went to the Congo and um, helped reintegrate child soldiers um, into, into their communities. And, and just, it's just it's very local, very hands-on work. And we've donated um, to them financially, but also every single person at Away um, uses their skills to help them. So our design team um, helped them with a rebrand. Um, like our comms team, like just like just gets like PR pieces for them. Um, our like our product development team has like made things for them to sell so so they can fundraise. Um, and I think that's been really valuable because we also just um, we like to remind our team that they have all of these talents and it just doesn't have to go towards like on on a like a, the grand side of things, like selling this amazing travel brand, or like on the worst days, just selling luggage. Um, it can actually do some good in the world, and I think that's made a huge impact on our culture. And I'm gonna ask you one more question before we throw to the audience. We're gonna have plenty of time <clears throat> for questions from you guys, so be thinking. Um, but I think that as a founder, you have a unique experience to build the culture of your organization from the ground up, and you'd had a number of work experiences before starting away. Um, what kind of culture do you want to have? What did you want to bring in and what did you want to leave out? I think there's this, uh, there's this misconception when you're starting a company that you just like have to know more than everybody else. Like mm -hmm. otherwise, why would you be the boss? And I think um, 
Steph and I learned really early on that the way we could succeed faster and, and do better as a team is just like through humility. Like we know um, our goal is to just hire people who are way better than us um, in the things that they do. Um, and I, I think you know, that that's a huge part of, of our culture. Like we hire people who are experts at what they do. Um, for example, our like our team that works on content and influencers, I think rivals any influencer agency out there, but they just get to work on our brand the whole time. Um, and, and because of that, we've just built these like amazing pockets of like really deep talent in, in the organization and we just like empower them to, to run with it. And I think, um, you know, people talk a lot about empowerment in internal cultures, but for us, um, we don't want someone to start it away and say like, okay, what do you want me to do? We want them to be telling us what we should be doing in their field, and, and we've done that from the beginning. Nice. Um, so I'm going to throw out to the audience, any questions that you have, uh, Jemima and Christy, I believe, will be um, coming by with a microphone. But uh, here in the front. My question was just about the, the book part. So you're faced with this challenge so early in the evolution of this company, and so many fail where you guys ended up kind of coming up with a solution, a solution that actually worked out there. So I know you already talked about it. Can you spend maybe just an extra minute talking about who, not necessarily who came up with the idea, but how did that gestation kind of c come about? Okay, well, I didn't, I, I didn't want to say. Um, but can you speak a tiny bit more about that? Because it's those aha moments in some ways that could have tipped, you know, if you'd given up, could have gone the exact opposite direction. So how collaborative was the process and how did it work? Yeah, I mean, it's, to be clear, I think that if we didn't do the book, it's not that we wouldn't have launched. I think that we would have just launched at like a worse time in the year. We'd have gotten less press. It would have been less exciting. So I actually think like we had this good idea to launch with a suitcase and get a bunch of press around it. But then the thing that we did turned out to be a better idea. Um, and and I, I, I have no idea like if it would have affected like how the brand took off, what people thought of us. But I do know that um, really counting on the fact that like storytelling was gonna be a big part of, of what we were building actually like, gave us the confidence to do that because otherwise it was, it was a lot of money to, to like hire a writer, to interview all these people, to like print these really beautiful books. And it was a risk that, that we took. Um, but, but I think at the end it was like, it was a long play, and, and it worked out. Um, in the middle. <laughs> thanks, Doug. <laughs> Look at that teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, as a follow-up to that question, actually, uh, the battery ban. Um, I feel like you guys had these kind of moments throughout the, the lifespan of your company so early on. What is it about a way that's made you so resilient? Yeah, it's actually funny. People are like, there's all these bad things that have happened. You guys are so resilient. And I'm like, for people are like, what were the challenges? I'm like, I don't know if there were any. They're like, were you around for the battery? <laughs> did, did you miss uh, that? But I, th I think it's like, it's a testament to how we kind of um, just like approach things in the organization. Like we're so iterative. We change things all the time. Like we don't ever feel like there's been one huge crisis or one big failure because like, Everyone's like consistently mobilized and, and changing things, and it's and it's part of the day to day. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the airlines basically decided, um, like around Christmas time, like the busiest travel travel period, um, that you couldn't bring lithium, lith you couldn't check lithium ion batteries mm. um, anymore. If you're gate checking it, you have to take them out. And our carry-ons have a built-in battery that was always removable from the inside, um, but in a, an ad, ad, admittedly like a more annoying process than it is now. We had actually, when we first designed the battery, we were like, okay, we have to make it removable. Um, we had gotten the feedback before all of this happened from our customers that they wish there was an easier way to take the battery out. So it was something that we were working on already and something that we had rolled out before the battery ban. Um, but but it wasn't something we publicized. So like the new bags had it, the older bags didn't. And that meant that our tens of thousands of like early adopters and first customers were trying to board these planes and the airlines were being horrendous to them. Um, like they weren't letting them board, like people were, were missing their flights, like people were looking for screwdrivers in the airport, like there weren't that many. <laughs> um, 
So we actually like just rallied the whole team around it. What we did was we offered a free retrofit program. So anyone who had the old type of battery um, could send it in or we could send them a DIY kit to replace theirs. Um, and this, this could have been like, there, there were just so many things. Like I think a lot of it was luck. We had already had the fix um, and, and we wanted to, to commit and, and really invest in our early customers by doing this for them. Um, it actually put two of our competitors out of business completely. Um, and I, I think it, it was then, I mean, obviously it was a lot of work, but it was then that we realized how big of a deal it could have been. Like for us, it was just like business as usual, let's try to do right by our customers, let's switch out their batteries. Um, but then when we heard the news that like the other companies like didn't survive this, this like crisis, mm -hmm. um, we realized like we, we could have been really screwed. Yeah. Um, but I think it's like never waste a crisis. We had, you know, we got so many positive like tweets and emails about this, about customers who were like, this is amazing that Away is doing this. Like we um, also were doing a lot of work behind the scenes with the airlines to try to help improve the customer experience. Um, so I think it was just like really actually brand defining for us in the way we handled it. Mm. Other questions? Okay. Um, first of all, congratulations. Uh, amazing company. We've heard a lot about it. I'm the chairman of the Sports Agents Association, and um, we have uh, travel events. Our athletes and entertainers travel a tremendous amount. I, I love the fact that you had a collaboration with D. Wade, but we have industry-specific things where our athletes, executives, and industry insiders go places together. Have you ever thought about doing a collaboration uh, with a destination in mind um, for a whole industry, or is it would it be just one-on-one -on -one athlete, entertainer, or whatnot? No, I think um, from like a collaboration and partnership standpoint, we're we're open to a lot of things. One of the things we're actually rethinking now is, you know, we've done we've done we built this amazing platform as a brand to do collaborations with um, with anyone from Carly Kloss and Dwayne Wade to, um, we did a collaboration with, with the Star Wars franchise uh, for the launch of their movie. We've done things with, um, with like the apparel brand Madewell. So it's actually incredible how we've been able to collaborate with lots of different industries and lots of different people. But as we look at, um, you know, the kind of company we want to be in 2019 and, and further down the line, we've realized that we need to really um, rethink the way we do our, collaborations and, and structure them in a way where there's a lot more impact. So I mean, I think there's just a lot, there's a lot that we haven't done yet. And I think if we were to do the same type of collaboration in 2018, as we have in 2018, it just like wouldn't make as much of a dent in, in the revenue that we're trying to create for next year. So open to ideas. <laughs> um, Gil, is that right? Or no, in the back, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. You talked about legacy brands who have they've spent billions and billions and decades building these amazing brands that people know. What are some simple things that they can do to get the love back from consumers that all these disruptors are taking away? What, so what are some of the things that legacy brands can do to get the love back? Yes. <laughs> so there's a reason I don't work at a legacy brand, because I actually think I would be really terrible at it. Um, I tried, and um, it, it didn't work out. But I, I think it's like, um, if you think about all of the new brands that are popping up, they are the ones that are working are successful because they are creating that, that connection with the customer. And I still, think, I still think there's a lot of legacy brands that are doing amazing things to connect with their customer. I think on both sides, whether you're a new startup or a legacy brand, if you're just trying to chase trends and trying to chase platforms without thinking about who you really are or the story you're trying to tell, like either, like anyone can fail. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's been the most important thing. I also think like for us, we had to, um, it was like a real wake up call for us over the last few months of like, okay, we've been, we've been striving to be like a top tier direct to consumer brand. And if you kind of look at the landscape, like 
we're doing it or we did it and we need to set our sights higher. And I think for both sides, it doesn't mean totally reinventing the wheel. Like we don't need to change like every aspect of how we sell things, whether it's online or offline or how we get customers. Like there's a reason there are legacy brands with billions of dollars in annual revenue and that we're not there yet. So I think it's like, um, no matter what kind of brand you are, like having the, the, the humility to, to know that you can succeed or you can fail either way. And also just knowing, um, knowing who your customer is and, and knowing who you are and, and creating that relationship. And I'm gonna ask you um, sort of a final question or almost give you a final challenge to wrap up here. Okay, so I want to imagine that there's an away carry-on right here. And we're going to pack this suitcase for a future founder, maybe even somebody in the room. Okay, so to okay. start, what color is the bag? Uh, it's the aluminum one. I just think it's like, okay. it's like the most common. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and what's an item that you can't travel without, this person should not travel without? Like, like metaphorically, or? You can go literal. <laughs> let's go like my, my co-founder's in it. Let's, let's go literal. <laughs> It's a large suitcase and Steph is inside. Can Steph fit? <laughs> is there an item that you have to have with you when you travel? Um, I do, <laughs> actually I tweeted about how this was a lie, but I pretend to do all my work on planes. So um, <laughs> like someone tweeted the other day, like um, I'll do it on the plane is the biggest lie I've ever told. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's me. <laughs> but I always bring noise canceling headphones, just like, no matter where you're sitting, like there are noises to, to drown out. It's good so. when you're pretending to work. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and what is like a book or a podcast that this person should have? Um, I'm a huge fan of how I built this. Um, I, I think it's just like all founders, interesting stories. Every single one is different. Um, and, and the host guy, I think, really just goes in deep and, and tries to figure out like people's motivations and intentions behind what they did versus just like saying what they did. And we're going to go metaphorical here. What kind of employee does this person need to bring along for the ride? Someone who's smarter than you. <laughs> yeah. And what is the one thing you have to leave behind? I think um, just like any preconceived notions of what you think you're supposed to be doing. Like any time I've ever tried to be like, okay, we're at this phase in the company and this is what we should be doing, I've been totally wrong. Um, and, and a big part of what I've really just been doing over the last few years is just like asking a ton of questions, like knowing when you don't know something. Um, I, you know, I think your employees look, will look to you a lot to, to answer their questions, but I think you can really only answer in like the context of the business. And if you're smart, like, you will figure out what you don't know and, and find the people that will give you that answer. Great. Jen, thank you so much. Thanks, guys.